Hello, this is Dr. Rocker, and we are going to do a brief review of Conus Medullaris Syndrome and Cauda Equina Syndrome. A lot of this information comes from Medscape.com, so you can um, double check some of the information or read a little bit deeper into that if you just uh, put in both of these conditions, followed by Medscape or eMedicine.com. You should have no problem getting a hold of them. To start with, I'd like to remind you with um, the fact that the spinal cord is going to terminate or come to an end at around the L1, L2 region of the vertebral bodies. And that area where the spinal cord terminates is known as the conus medullaris as it tapers off into what turns into a uh, phylum terminale and several nerve roots, which are collectively called the cauda equina, which means horse's tail because of its appearance. This is really the interface of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And as such, we can see some complex features with cauda equina syndrome and conus medullaris syndrome. Know that the cause of either of these conditions involves some sort of compression, destruction, or inflammation of those areas within the spinal cord. So location is very important on uh, which of these two syndromes is likely to develop. But causes of both are going to be in descending order here. Spinal stenosis, usually an age-related narrowing of the spinal canal. Physical trauma, as this image shows you right here to the spine. We could see disc herniations protruding into these regions inside of the spinal cord. We could also see tumors that are primary to the central nervous system, and the two most common would be schwannomas or ependymomas. Or we might see metastasis from tissues that become cancerous elsewhere and then spread to the central nervous system here. Uh, in descending order, it's lung cancer, breast cancer, renal cancer, and colorectal cancer that tend to metastasize and produce conus medullaris syndrome or cauda equina. Also, we can see some infection within the spinal cord. Uh, we might collectively call that a myelopathy, but specifically if we see inflammation of the gray or white matter of the spinal cord, it's usually referred to as myelitis, and that can be a cause of both of these as well. Starting with conus medullaris syndrome, this is some sort of compression or destruction within the spinal cord between usually no higher than about T12 vertebral body region through about as low as, well, the end of the conus medullaris, right around L2. So some sort of compression or destruction of that area of the spinal cord is going to produce what we call conus medullaris syndrome, a collection of all of these things that we're going to talk about. Usually this has a sudden onset, many times with intense low back pain, and we're going to see features that are both indicative of upper motor neuron lesions and lower motor neuron lesions. And most obviously, the manifestations of an upper motor neuron lesion will be hyperreflexia, and the manifestations of a lower motor neuron lesion will be hyporeflexia. And we can see both of those prominently inside of the lower extremity uh, neurologic findings in this condition. Most of the time, the back pain as well as the neurologic findings are going to be bilateral. We're going to see fairly prominent bilateral lower extremity motor weakness. We're also very likely to see minor radiculitis inside of these individuals. And again, it's usually going to be bilateral. As far as reflexes goes, this tends to preserve the knee-jerk reflex while inhibiting uh, or uh, increasing the ankle-jerk reflex. So because we can't see upper or motor neuron features, it could be a very brisk or hyperreflexic ankle-jerk reflex, or it may be reduced. We could see either one. Also, we can see things like perianal pain or numbness. So the area around the anus can be painful or numb. We also can see early incontinence. So fairly early on in the progression of conus medullaris syndrome, we're going to see incontinence, the inability to maintain normal bowel and bladder functionality. So we're going to see loss of bladder functionality and loss of bowel functionality, functionality producing incontinence of both of those. Also in males, we tend to see very common impotence in conus medullaris syndrome. If we contrast those features to cauda equina syndrome, we see nearly purely lower motor neuron lesions here. These involve the nerve roots that are technically part of the peripheral nervous system, even though sort of counterintuitively they're still intraspinal. They are formally part of the 
peripheral nervous system as they are nerve roots. So we're going to see more prominent hyporeflexia. These types of compression or destruction, these lesions are going to be found distal to the conus medullaris, so somewhere there in the cauda equina. So anywhere distal to the L2 region through around the sacral region. This tends to have more gradual onset in the features compared to the sudden onset of features in conus medullaris syndrome. We're going to see back pain in these patients, but the back pain tends to be unilateral in nature, as are the neurologic features as we're showing you here. The, uh, the neurologic features are characterized by obvious saddle numbness. So we're talking inner thigh and perianal or perineal region numbness. So the areas that would be in contact with a horse's saddle are going to be numb. That's very characteristic for cauda equina syndrome. We're also likely to see a lower extremity motor weakness. That is again going to be unilateral. We're also likely to see unilateral radiculopathy or sciatica in these patients. As far as reflexes go, usually in cauda equina syndrome, we're going to see both ankle and knee jerk reflexes affected. And because these are lower motor neuron lesions, they're very likely to be hyporeflexic. All right. We might see some urinary retention like we saw uh, with some, or sorry, we might see some urinary tension, retention here in cauda equina syndrome later on in the progression of this condition if it is not detected uh, very quickly and contrast that to the urinary incontinence that was found with conus medullaris syndrome. Also in this condition, impotence is quite rare in males affected with cauda equina syndrome. In summary, these are both going to be neurosurgical emergencies, meaning immediate neurological consultation is absolutely required in every single patient that is even suspected of having one of these two conditions. That is definitely something to be emphasized. Also know that in the world of the spinal cord here, especially if we've got one of these pathologies affecting right there at the junction between the conus medullaris and the cauda equina, we might see a combination of features that are more characteristic of conus medullaris syndrome that are combined with features that are more characteristic of um, cauda equina syndrome. So we may see some blending of these two. They're not purely exclusive black or white. We do see some blending occasionally. Also know that the severity of the features or how likely somebody is to recover from this, their prognosis, is highly dependent on the size or the magnitude of spinal or nerve root compression here, as well as how quickly that is done. The larger the magnitude of compression or destruction of these regions of the spinal cord or nerve roots, the more serious this is and the less favorable their prognosis. And not surprisingly, the faster the rate of compression or destruction, uh, the less favorable the prognosis is. Hopefully this was helpful. Have a great day.